Good morning, everybody. Um, what I've done is do, do um, a presentation, and I've tried to keep it relatively concise, bearing in mind the time constraints. Um, I do have a paper, but it's, I think I thought in the end it was just too rough to share with you. So rather than inflict it on you, I might, uh, in the next week or two, try to improve it and then circulate it if you're interested. And the papers um, and the talk is uh, connected with the idea of um, advancing a discourse institutional approach to, uh, in, uh, to understanding and analysing uh, governance in sustainability related transitions. Briefly, some background. Um, where I'm coming from, in a way, is to think about um, sustainability transitions as um, some uh, example of the wicked problem of climate change. So, amongst other things, this idea of a wicked policy problem is connected with the, the notion that the formulation of a problem is the problem. As soon as we begin to um, uh, consider um, what the problem is, we're already entering into potential solutions what they could be or what they might not be. So the labelling and framing of uh, a problem is all important, or is important, I don't say all important, but is important. Unlike to this, um, uh, an interesting issue is how do we deal with uh, the persistence of unsustainability? There's a lot of attention to sustainability transitions, but maybe we want to think about unsustainability and embedded as, uh, existing prevailing practices and uh, economic and social structures and what these have to do with um, inhibiting transition. Third point um, is to do with uh, understanding and substantiating what type 2 governance might mean. Harry Bulkley has done a lot of work on, on, on governance um, in the sort of geographical sphere and uh, she contrasts type 1 and type 2 governance. Type 2 governance might be uh, an approach to governing uh, environmental concerns, whereby we value the interventions and, include, and we include myriad actors who are dispersed across space and time. Okay, that sounds like a very different kind of governance from uh, type one governance, which is more to do with a focus on government, local government, and supranational government um, uh, policy. Now, when we come to, to you know, get to the nub of this discourse institutional approach. Um, I'm struck by how we've not perhaps um, seized uh, the opportunity to, to deal with language within our studies of, of transition, within sort of the um, systems innovation uh, literature. And I wonder whether we should or why we don't and whether we could uh, deal with language better. Now, I'm a bit hesitant here because uh, as you delve deeper, you, you start to think, well, maybe there's, there's probably a reason why not. It's difficult to embrace and to you know, take into account uh, matters of language, whilst at the same time dealing with a literature which is also already mushrooming in terms of its uh, multidisciplinary um, span, scope. So, you know, why should we have discourse to, to all our problems? Um, as well as that, um, we want to think about, maybe we could think about uh, how we deal with uh, issues of time, temporal, temporal uh, aspects, and spatiality, governance across borders, or governance at, quotes different levels. So, in sum, um, I'm going to try to maybe make a few suggestions um, about how we might consider going about this by looking at how neo-institutional analysis combined critical discourse analysis, what that might look like in developing um, a, a, a different approach to, to governance. Uh, the neo-institutional neo analysis, um, that's work which uh, is coming from the sociology uh, of organisations and organisation studies. Um, so the key figures that I, that I refer to uh, are people like Scott and uh, Paolo DiMaggio. Um, and then for discourses, uh, I'm particularly uh, interested in critical discourse analysis um, and the work of um, people like Fairclough who are interested in a political agenda um, uh, behind empowering critical discourse analysis whereby we look at 
who whose voices are present or absent in talk about uh, the particular phenomenon under scrutiny. Okay, in terms of governance, this is this is my definition, which I've kind of cobbled together from others uh, who came before me, and I'm defining governance as the steering of society desired directions involving systems of rules and rulemaking. Okay, these desired directions, I think it's uh, important to notice the S here. Okay, there are lots of different directions in which uh, uh, steering of society uh, takes place routinely in an everyday way, not only in the policy sphere, but um, in industry, in the green lobby, NGOs, amongst the populace as a whole. There are different ideas about what we ought to do in the name of climate change. Um, which preferences prevail is, is, a, is a matter for our analysis. And how those get translated into different systems of rules and rulemaking is uh, something that I'll talk about in the rest of the talk. So this, um, I've been wrestling with this. I've had all sorts of very complicated and very schematic pictures in my, <laughs> on my uh, whiteboard in my office. And I had something which was just so, so pathetically complex, I couldn't hope to describe it. Yet. So I ended up with this uh, for now. Uh, so if you tell me to rubbish, I'll go back and you know, I'll think again. Uh, but essentially, we can see governance as text, as discursive practice, as social practice. So this is borrowing from Fekker's critical discourse analysis. So rules we can see as written down in documents, in bills, acts of parliament, and so on. We can see the rules laid down in the, the transition handbook. And if you're familiar with the transition town movement, they have a handbook that sets out the rules for how to create a transition town. Those are examples of text which might be relevant to governance. Governance is discursive practice. Uh, well, this is an example possibly of governance is discursive practice. Discursive practice refers to the kinds of um, places in which uh, governance and sustainability are talked. So this could be meetings, could be in interviews, public debates, um, so community level meetings about uh, greening uh, Newcastle. So governance is to do with um, social relations and this is where the production and interpretation of text occurs. And the governance of social practice is uh, to do with the social and historical context of all of this. So why the social practices uh, for governance to do policy making or public engagement uh, have a uh, uh, symbiotic relationship uh, with uh, the, uh, the forums and fora in which uh, governance is talked and the particular products of that talk, the text. Okay, but it's, uh, uh, they're mutually constitutive. Now, so that's the, as far as discourse and art is concerned, we talk about governance, text, discursive practice and social practice. We, can, we might understand institutions as being constituted by discourse. So that in looking at text, discursive practice, and social practice, we see the reproduction of existing conventions as the social, as the uh, critical discourse analysis would have it, existing conventions, or the creation of new conventions. That institutionalist, institutionalists would refer to those as rules. Okay, so if we're looking at governance as text, and discursive practice and social practice, we should also be able to um, explain what rules are allied to governance at those different levels. We may also look for uh, what kinds of mechanisms uh, bind uh, people to uh, the adherence of those rules. So that we would look at um, uh, the kind of more coercive processes which bind people to follow uh, uh, regulative rules, uh, the more normative processes which bind people towards uh, to norm-related norm, norm rules, and the more um, mimetic or imitative uh, mechanisms which uh, uh, um, reinforce adherence to uh, cultural cognitive rules. We might also look at what kinds of carriers there are of, of these rules. These carriers can be symbolic or in the relations between different protagonists, or how the different protagonists um, label each other 
as activists or citizens or consumers, okay, as wicked capitalists or industrialists, and so on. And then here we have institutional processes, which is to do with the segmentation of these rules through society. That's the depth of the, the embedding of those rules. So we might look at rules in, which are created and become established or not within local context, local sites. If successful, they may become more objectified, uh, codified, and they may diffuse more widely throughout society. And that's called sedimentation. So that's just uh, to essentially break down even further what uh, we mean uh, by the discourse analysis as text discursive practice and social practice. I probably don't have time to go through all of these. But in terms of the texts, we might consider what kind of, kinds of legitimation strategies are employed, what kinds of rationalizations are employed for particular uh, uh, measures in an act of parliament or in a bill. Rationalizations might say, well, we need to do X because it will develop the, the, you know, the green economy or the renewable energy sector. Or it might be that the rationalization could or should be about uh, the democratization of governance. Uh, in terms of discursive practice, um, we might uh, try to identify the, the various networks and coalitions uh, at work uh, in producing those texts and the different kinds of uh, uh, ways in which identities are ascribed, either on one's own behalf, identifying oneself as, as a green pioneer, or on others' behalf. Okay. And in social practice, with respect to social practice, we, we try to analyse the uh, social and historical context, and I'll have to move on. That's just summing it up again. Okay, and that's uh, basically a, a quick run through. Okay, some reflections. A discourse institutional process might enable us to uh, consider a, a wider or deeper understanding of a wider range of governance, governance institutions, not only government institutions. Uh, it may, I mean, I'll, we'll have to work on this one a bit more, but we may be able to think about the persistence of conventions through language and the novelty, how novelty you know, comes about. And to recognise the role of language in the constitutions of institutions, where institutions are not only constraints, but possibly um, are connected with some kind of create, creative approach to developing new rules of the game. <coughs> okay, so many um, things I think we'll, we might talk about throughout the day, uh, not just in terms of what I've said, but so the issues of method. Are we concerned with uh, more universe, universal theorising, generalisations? Um, the new institutional uh, approaches tend to have that more than discourse analytical approaches, especially CDA, uh, which is kind of more prone to case studies and limited case studies looked at in, in great depth. How we draw boundaries around what they call the organisation field in the institutional uh, analysis is, is, always a, is also an issue. Um, when we're looking at texts, which texts do we include, which ones do we exclude? You know, um, in terms of the feasibility of the work that's involved to, to do discourse analysis, where do we draw the lines and how do we draw them? Who draws them? And then, uh, just one more point before I finish. How, how do we deal methodologically with the study of uh, a transition which is actually yet to occur? We don't know if, we, we don't know if we're some way through a sustainability transition in the UK or you know, at the start of a, uh, a process which will deliver the goods or falter and fail. And often there's a tendency to use the language, uh, to use language to suggest that this transition transition is almost self-evident in its eventual success. Okay. We don't know. So how do we deal with this um, analysis in the frame? Okay, I'll leave it there. Okay. Absolutely.